California, 1949. The war is won and the world is red hot and ready to rock. Cometh the hour, cometh the man, and cometh the man with a plan. This is the Righteous Bojambo, and it's time to talk about the Fender Telecaster. This is a story of how music met at a crossroads, with ambitious players proclaiming a manifesto of get on or go home, the advance of technology spurred by a cataclysmic war, the shining beacon and benefits of classical American capitalism, and through all of that, a little guy who hit it big with a great idea. This is a Fender Telecaster. It is, in fact, my Fender Telecaster. His name's Old Buck. Yes, a gender nominative Telecaster, but in the interest of diversity, my previous Telecaster was a female. Her name was Dusty. Old Buck is a 2007 American Standard model, and when he came out of the workshop in Corona, California, he was fundamentally the same guitar as one which came out of the original Fender plant, not 25 miles away in Fullerton some 55 years earlier, or with less than a handful of design modifications and a change of name, pretty much the same instrument that first rolled out in 1951. The Fender Telecaster is the workhorse that dragged most of popular music, much against its will, into modernity. Beloved as its gussied up city cousin the Stratocaster may be, the Strat has never been able to match the perfect balance of the brutal and the beautiful that its distinctive and ruthlessly functional predecessor possesses, and, while the iconography of the Stratocaster is unsurpassed in the history of particularly rock music, the CV of the Telecaster, sporting as it does country music, rockabilly, rock and roll, the blues, reggae, soul music or funk as the go-to guitar, is virtually unimpugnable. While some perfunctory attempts to amplify various acoustic instruments have been going on since before World War I, the first working electric guitar patents were lodged in the early 1930s. Just who built and marketed the first electric guitar is a bone of some contention, but it seems to narrow down to the Rickenbacker Company in partnership with National, who certainly had the first electric guitar to sell in any numbers, the infamous Frying Pan, a Hawaiian-styled lap steel guitar. The first hit records to feature an electric lap steel were by Milton Brown and his Brownies, the band that gave Bob Wills and Tommy Duncan their starts. In a sad aside, Brown was to die tragically in 1936 after suffering an attack of narcolepsy while driving on the Jacksboro Highway. The electric guitar, as most people would recognise, emerged in 1932 with Rickenbacker's hollow-bodied electro-Spanish model. Sporting such innovations that we take for granted today, such as being able to play standing up, full access to all frets and a vibrato bar, it wasn't a runaway success, selling about 50 during its three-year run. Vivitone produced the first mass-marketed, such as a mass-market existed, solid-body guitar in 1934. Sales were slow, but once Gibson entered the market in 1936 with their legendary ES-150, players such as Freddie Green and Count Basie's orchestra and the magical Charlie Christian established the possibility of the instrument and through World War II another wave of electric guitar heroes Merle Travis, T-Bone Walker, Oscar Moore, Sister Rosetta Tharp, Ernest Tubbs cavalcade of phenomenal pickers such as Jimmy Short, Butterball Page, the unrelated Billy and Jerry Bird, Billy a jazz guitarist in a Stetson and Boots and Jerry godfather of steel guitar and the absolutely amazing string of brilliant guitarists in Bob Wills' band Leon McAuliffe, another steel guitar maestro, the bluesy Eldon Shamblin, the nimble-fingered jazzman Jimmy Weibel, perhaps a pick of them all in Junior Barnard, a down-and-dirty player whose signature was to overload his amp and most likely created the overdriven guitar tone that helped create rock and roll and came to dominate popular music until about 1968. 
and Herb Remington, the innovative steel guitarist. After the war, Les Paul emerged along with Merle Travis and they began to rewrite both the technical and technological vocabulary of the guitar. With interest in and demand for the new electric guitar driven by the emergence of small hornless combos that needed to generate volume in honky tonks and smoky clubs growing every day, it was in 1948 that a little heralded radio repairman in Fullerton, California named Leo Fender had a very good idea about how he could fill a niche in the market. Leo, who never actually learned to play the guitar himself, set to work on a prototype of a guitar that would meet a few basic design and quality principles. It had to be light, it had to hold its tune well, it had to have the fast neck so the country players could play what they called takeoff guitar, the bridge had to provide a bright, well-projected tone, the bridge needed to be adjustable, it needed to be easy to repair and most of all, it had to be inexpensive to make. Back in 1943, Leo, who started making Hawaiian guitars the next year, built a crude wooden guitar to try out his ideas for pickups and configurations. The instrument, with its twangy piercing tone, was road tested in the tonks around Fullerton. It became so popular, despite looking like an absolute horror to play, that Fender was able to rent it to pickers. But it was five years before Fender ran with the idea for a second prototype, and at this point the recognisable Telecaster that met those design and production principles emerged. With a successful prototype now in place, Leo again loaned the guitar out to enthusiastic local pickers and took their advice on refining the design. By 1950 he was ready to go to production with the single pickup Fender Esquire. All of the classic elements of the Telecaster were in place, albeit with a single bridge pickup still playable examples of the original Esquire, extremely rare. A 1951 model will run you between 45 and 60,000 Australian dollars. The broadcaster added a truss rod and at that point with one major change is completely recognisable as the Telecaster is used today. The broadcaster didn't last long in production as with its popularity amongst country players increasing, the Gretsch Guitar Company threatened to sue Fender over the name. Gretsch made a broadcaster line of drums, and obviously it's very easy to mistake a drum kit for a guitar, so Fender backed down. For a short period, they were marketed as simply Fender guitars with no trade name. About 500 of these were made. Christened no-casters by the guitar community, these are now a seriously valuable proposition. An all original will cost you over a hundred thousand Australian dollars. But by mid-1951 the guitars coming off the production line had a new name on the headstock under the famous Fender logo, the Telecaster. The next major change was in 1952 when the guitar's electrics were changed to those we know today. This is important because what it did was give an independent tone selection to the bridge pickup which really unleashed the twangy sound and the volume of the guitar. It gave the guitar its immediately identifiable Telecaster characteristic. The Telecaster was a solid success both in the studio and on the road. Part of the success lay in Leo's innovative production line techniques, especially his controversial bolt-on neck which meant that there was always a ready supply of instruments. Gibson still hand carved their guitars and required a much larger workforce and a much heavier price tag. Gibson struck back, however, in 1952 with the release of their classic Les Paul model. The telly's main threat, though, came from closer to home. In 1954, Fender was set to replace it with their new space-age googie-themed Stratocaster. up and up in every way, the Stratocaster was ostensibly a more tonally adaptable guitar, hoping doubtless to cash in on the jazz market which had given the Telecaster the swerve and still favoured Gibson and the like, featuring a breathtaking tremolo effect from the new lightweight tremolo arm and a masterclass in guitar ergonomics. The Stratocaster appeared to have it all. But the players saw a place for both models and after talking to them, Leo reluctantly left the Telecaster in production. Within two years, the Stratocaster was outselling the Telecaster. Today it outsells it by up to 12 to 1. The Telecaster was the guitar of the established working musicians and the Stratocaster appealed more to the rising mass of teenagers getting into rock and roll. 
Many of these teens had their own source of disposable income now from jobs in the burgeoning services sector, in a booming American economy, and an electric guitar and a Fender amp, of course, were trophies and totems of the march of Western affluence. The strat was gaudy. For an extra 5% on the payment price, you could have your guitar finished in any colour from the DuPont paint catalogue. The Telecaster, on the other hand, came in three colours, sunburst, blonde or butterscotch, until well into the 1960s. One of the reasons the Telecaster survived then, as it survives today, is that despite only being a two pickup guitar, the Tele bridge and neck pickups are very different from each other, while all three Stratocaster pickups do basically the same job. This makes the Telecaster have a wider range tone-wise between the two extremes. With the switching system and the single tone control, the player can blend the sounds accordingly to what they want to hear. But even then, it wasn't all smooth sailing for the Telecaster. In 1965, Leo Fender sold his company to communications giant CBS for $13 million. CBS had bought the New York Yankees for just over $11 million the year before. That worked out well. CBS's ownership of Fender was controversial and it did see the Telecaster drop down the priority pecking order for redesign and spec quality. New Telecaster models were slow in coming. In 1969, the Thinliner chambered model was introduced and upgraded in 1972 to support two Gibson-style humbuckers, which meant the guitar would be less noisy at high volumes. The Custom also came out in 1972 with a humbucker at the neck and a traditional Tele bridge pickup. This model was much favoured by Keith Richards. Again in 1972, the Telecaster Deluxe came out, sporting wide range pickups more suited for heavy rock and metal. I've played one. It was horrible. 1989 saw the Telecaster Plus, with special pickups designed to further reduce the noise traditionally associated with the single coil pickups. Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead sometimes uses one of these. And in 2009, the Cabernita, which features pickups more like a Gretsch guitar. There was even a 12-string Telecaster. Back in the mid-1980s, the mark was in sad straits. As an example, Jeff Buckley, who was almost as formidable a guitarist as he was a singer, used a 1983 Telecaster which Andy Wallace described as the worst musical instrument ever made. And my first Telecaster, a 1986 model, was in all truth a bit of a rubbish guitar. Even the most wondrous of the new Tele players to emerge in the 1980s, Prince, used a Tele knockoff that sounded more like a vintage Telecaster than current models. It wasn't until the mid-90s and CBS being given the boot when Fender's employees bought the company that quality improved in a new wave of edgy guitarists. Frank Black, Jim Root, Johnny Greenwood, Graham Coxon, plus the new traditionals like Jim Campolongo and Matt Hill put the Telecaster back into favour with both listeners and players. For almost 70 years, the Fender Telecaster has survived and prospered because at its heart, it's the near-perfect execution of a perfect idea. It's not a guitar that tries to be all things to all players. Its cousin, the Jazzmaster, was doomed to cult status due to this. But a guitar that is work to play, but always rewards the work. It has limitations. Without the humbucking or lace sensor pickups in the Telecaster Custom or Deluxe, it doesn't play well with high gain amplifiers, and some say it's not a good guitar for jazz, but Bill Frazell and Mike Stern would beg to differ. In its favour, its consistency and breadth of tone mean that it combines well with what are called lower headroom amplifiers, usually up to 50 watts that start to break up when they're pushed to top volume, giving a natural overdrive can maintain the character of their tone through almost any stomp box and that twang and heart attack low sustain sound which has been the trademark of the guitar and around which so many styles of music are built is endlessly attractive to players. But it's more than that, it's an enduring symbol of not only the music but of the endurance of traditional values in music making of a time when we aspire to a world with a fast, relentless soundtrack of progress in the advance of aspiration, and to the power of one man, one good idea, and the will of the marketplace to affirm that idea. Because even more than human genius, they are the factors that determine the success of one kind of music over another, that the music reflects the predominant values of society at the time, 
and that the economic factors exist that sponsor and promote the music. For example, Bob Wills had brilliant guitarists, but his music required a dozen or more people on stage, so those costs had to be passed on to the consumer. Ernest Tubb had brilliant guitarists, but he only had four people on stage. His music was cheaper to make, cheaper to move, and cheaper to sell. Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf did much the same in Chicago, battling over turf in clubs to a working class audience who wanted something loud they could dance to on a Saturday night. Elvis Presley took the small, self-contained combo to an audience who were being inculcated at the concept of leisure and disposable income and, allied to the power of another society-shaping event, the emergence of television, went nationwide and then worldwide through the movies and the Telecaster, or the electric guitar in general, was the key tool in bridging those economical, societal, and musical factors for the next 40 years. So that's who made them, and that's who played them. All in all, it hasn't been a bad career for the Fender Telecaster, the old plank, the toilet seat with strings, the hammer of the honky-tonk gods, the machine that basically made popular music as we understand it. Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. So, the Fender Telecaster. Any fellow Telecaster players out there? I'd love to hear your experiences of playing the wondrous instrument and of what it was that led you to make the ultimate decision to choose it as your guitar of choice. My list of teleblasters, was there anyone whom I too glaringly and insultingly omitted? I'd be keen to know, particularly blues players, because that part of the list did seem appallingly short. Um, a couple of corrections and apologies to make. Firstly, the apology simply for um, there being so much information that could have gone into this presentation. Uh, I had to compartmentalise it, editorialise it, and editorialising is inevitably personal. So I know that there were some deliberate omissions, particularly in the area around the models that came out between 1969 and 1999. Would be happy to hear of any other editions. And the correction is really um, more a poor example that I chose in terms of Bob Wills to typify the economic conditions in music around the time of the Second World War. Bob Wills was very conscientious, particularly during the Depression era, to keep his admission prices at rock bottom low levels so that as many people as possible in as many towns as possible could come to see his shows. That was a policy of Wills and he was quite well known for it. So he wasn't a very good example for me to have used there. That said, um, why not grab a cool beverage and a plate of biscuits, sit down and enjoy the playlist of the dozen or so finest Telecaster players who come to my mind immediately. And until the next time we meet together in good fellowship or the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff and you stay righteous. Ooh, that looks like a <laughs> that is gonna fall.